God, hallelujah. Praise your name, Lord Jesus. We magnify you. We glorify you, Lord God. We magnify you, Jesus. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. It's morning prayer live and welcome. Welcome <coughs> to all of you, wherever you are this morning. I want to ask you to join me this morning in prayer for our morning prayer live family, wherever they are. We have some friends in Florida right now that we want to pray for and thank God for them. Uh, we thank God for you wherever you are. We thank God for Ava Grace's mom and their family. My God, you know, they have been in a fight. Uh, and uh, this morning, we, you know, I find it really interesting. The last few days that I haven't had morning prayer live, we haven't had any rain this morning. <laughs> we are having tremendous rain. Amen. Good morning, yes, my dear sister Charmaine, hallelujah, Martin, good morning to you, glory to God, glory to God, <coughs> my God, sister Olivine, woo, uh, I like that, joy, olive manners, amen, and glory to God, we just, we are just giving God all the glory and all the honor, amen, but, um, Again, before I, before I run too far ahead, I'm Pastor Winston Watson. I'm coming to you from the beautiful parish of St. Mary um, in uh, the Caribbean Sea on the island of Jamaica. Wow. And I want to give you a chance to worship this morning for just a few minutes, just to thank God <coughs> in this season of Thanksgiving for who he is and what he has done. Amen wonderful God that we serve. The King of glory Glorious Father that we serve. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We glorify you. We honor you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There is a King seated among us let every heart receive him now Where there is praise He will inhabit There will be grace and mercy all around Every burden will be lifted in his presence Every trophy will be laid down at His feet. There is a name that reigns above all others. It's Jesus Christ, the King above all kings. Mm -hmm. Buried in 
will behold him and every tear he'll wipe away and we'll be at home the war will be over and so we will be our savior face to face You know, I, I think a lot of people this morning are <laughs> still recuperating from last night's or uh, yesterday's um, Thanksgiving meal. <laughs> Amen. But uh, thank you for joining us early today. You, I'm sure you have seen, amen, I'm sure you've seen the, um, <clears throat> the title for this morning. It, it's I want you, but I'm going to change that first word uh, a little bit. Instead of engaging, I want to say exploding into your. Uh, in, engaging your is one thing. Um, it means you may be touching it a little bit, but ex an explosion into your spiritual power. You know, many of us, many of us over the years, you know, we have had potential. When you, um, if you have been to college, one of the things they do uh, before um, you enter college or just before uh, you leave high school, they do an analysis, an, an aptitude test. In the spiritual world <clears throat> or in, in the church world, we tend to say we give people um, a, a test of their gifts. Uh, you know, to, to determine what kind of gifts they have. Well, that's interesting. You can do that, but God calls and pulls on gifts that you may not know you have because there is something called potential. And so when you are in high school and you're getting ready to go off and you're thinking about, well, what career do I want? How do I want to engage the world in my 20s and 30s and 40s? <clears throat> you take this aptitude test amen and it kind of focuses you on areas of study that would be good and then sometimes we also look at the environment that they the 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 um the the economy and the culture and different things and say well what is an emerging <clears throat> what is an emerging field that i would really like to get involved with some people said well way back when they wanted to get involved with computers they wanted to get involved in in you know economics, whatever it might have been at the time. But many of us, you know, we as Christians don't take the time to do those kinds of things, and we ought to. We ought to take the time to really find out what our spiritual um, gifts, not in the sense of how people do it, but in the sense of talking to God and find out, God, what is it that you really have for me to do? Amen. God, what is it that I am just on the tip of the iceberg about, but there is so much more for me to engage, but I've probably not been touching it. Because you are like, in the world, Satan is afraid of you. <clears throat> the satanic kingdom, why do you think um, like cancers and the different things are allowed 
um, to you know through the satanic touch and through circumstances. And why do you think sickness and disease and all of these calamitous things come? Because the satanic kingdom or the kingdom of darkness is absolutely in trepidation of you. Because you are like a volcano that is underneath um, just, you know, you can, you can feel the vibration. You can feel the movement of the plates under the, under the earth. You can feel, <clears throat> you know, the power that's generating within your belly, in, in your spirit. Uh, but the enemy comes in and the enemy does things to put you off. <laughs> Focus. The enemy comes in to, to derail you. The enemy comes in to, you know, to defeat your knowledge base and your, you know, and, you know, your direction and your purpose in the kingdom of God. And it creates a spiritual bondage, you know, that holds you back. We are the exploding power of the presence of God in you does not really come out. Then, you know, you're docile, you are quiet, you are calm. And <clears throat> when situations arise, when you ought to be fervent and you ought to be, uh, you, know, you know, really, you know, pit bull in nature in attacking the enemy, my God, <laughs> hey. You ought to be storming the gates of hell and storming the situations <clears throat> that would confront you and confront those around you. But we are quiet and we are calm and we really aren't engaging things the way we ought to engage them. Why? Because we have not really understood what the enemy has been doing in us. But listen to this scripture. It's 1 Peter 1.23. I think I spoke about it the last time. My God, you know, uh, there's a, there is a, a group that I'm in. I, I made a note to myself a while ago, so I'm looking at it. There's a group that I'm in in Facebook, and the name of it is Still Standing. <clears throat> and uh, Still Standing. And uh, I think we are remiss in using those terms sometimes because they calm us uh, in the sense that I don't want to, be just still standing. <laughs> I don't want to be after the enemy has come in. I am just still standing. Um, you think about the three Hebrew boys that were put in the fiery furnace. They were not just still standing. You think about those individuals that have been through some of the issues, you know, of life, you know, in the, in the Old Testament scriptures. At the end of it all, they were not just still standing. They were victorious. And the New Testament tells us that in Christ, we are always caused to triumph. We are the triumphant ones. We are, in the book of Ephesians, the glorious church. You know, we are the head and not the tail. <clears throat> we, are, we are soaring on eagles' wings. We ride the wings of the wind. Amen? And uh, it, it's a challenge sometimes for us when other people around us that are, you know, uh, um, that ought to be wise, that have been in Christendom for a while, that have been around for a while, when they tell us, oh, calm down, you know, it doesn't take all that. It doesn't need all that. But, but there is something that God, in 2020, and we're down almost to the end of 2020, and many of us are, you know, contemplating how awful 2020 was. But I truly believe that 2020 was allowed to bring us to a place, a young man, and I have a video of it that I'm going to be putting up at some point in time. A young man said, 2020, by the way, when I say a young man, I mean maybe a nine or a 10 year old. He said 2020 taught him some things. This is a 10-year-old now, <clears throat> 2020. He's from Texas. And he said, you know, 2020 showed me how to do some things differently and better. 2020 opened me up and prepared me for 2021 and 2022. He said, for the future. Amen. And so <clears throat> what, what, if you reflect on 2020, yes, there were issues. Yes, there were some significant challenges. Yes, people were going through, but I'm, I, I would dare say that most of you, 
that are uh, um, with me on morning prayer live. You did not have the same situations. Um, most of you that are Christians and walking with God, you did not have the same serious, whether it be financial, <clears throat> you know, the economic side of things, or the in the sense of even business side of things, or relationship side of things. You didn't have the same challenges that the rest of the world had. You walked, you heard about COVID, <clears throat> but you walked with a sense that you were protected. You were the Hepzibah of God, amen? You walked with a sense that you were surrounded by the angelic presence. So something came alive in you. <clears throat> Many people <clears throat> in 2020 realized that it wasn't the building that was the church. It was you <laughs> and me. That the power of God was not dependent on the denomination and the building that I went in on a Sunday morning, but it was dependent on me. And I could worship God wherever I was. I could worship God. I could use technology that was rejected. I could use technology that I was not familiar with. And how many people were totally unfamiliar with the technological platforms available for ministry and then all of a sudden, in 2020, they were thrust in an arena where they had to now develop a, a rudimentary, at least a rudimentary, understanding of what technology was really all about. Amen? And how it could be used to foster the growth of the body of Christ and to create an exploding and powerful army for God. Amen? And so you have jumped on you know, on this bandwagon, so to speak, and you have jumped into this atmosphere. There are many Christians that have been deceived by the evil one. Satan is called the deceiver. His ability in, is in his deception. You know, his ability is in his deception. He's like a toothless dog, but he's got a very serious sounding bark. Amen? <clears throat> and you have got to watch that because you listen to the bark and you don't realize there isn't a big bite. Amen? There isn't an ability to really uh, do what he says that he wants to do. Um, because God is God in your life and there's a tremendous power. There's an exploding force, an explosive force that's within your belly that's getting ready to come out if you would allow it. But many of us, because of Satan's deceptions, um, we have sat back and we have gone to the bed and held the pillow and we have lied down um, and we have not come to the place of really exploding. Amen? Jesus stripped him of his authority and his power. God's word will always strip the armor from Satan and bring to light his deception. Did you hear what I just said? God's word will always strip the armor from Satan and bring to light the deception of the enemy. Deception is his only protection, my God. Deception is his only ability to shut you down. Amen? <clears throat> and he deceives you into believing certain things about yourself, about the word. God's word will penetrate that armor of deception. And it will expose Satan for who he is. See, many are held in bondage this morning by certain scriptures. Did you hear what I just said? Many are held in bondage by certain scriptures. Now, you would think that scriptures are freedom. Scriptures set you free. Scriptures open you up. But, but hang on a second. Just hold on with me for just a moment. Have you noticed that the devil tried to put Jesus in bondage by quoting scriptures? Hey, <clears throat> you're not the only one. The enemy of our soul attempted to do with Jesus what he's doing with us. Now the enemy knows a few scriptures, but of course, he's been around for a while and he knows them sometimes better than you and I. He knows them well, but he will quote them out of context. And, to, and he wants to use them to bring you into bondage with the out of context and the misinterpreted. And you will say, well, you know, it was the Lord that shared that with me. No, 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 not necessarily. You got to understand now 
that there are things that will come from the enemy that will sound like God. Hey, my, 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 but you've got to know who's speaking, my Lord. If you take scripture out of context, my friends, you can make the Bible say anything, amen, you want it to say. You know, the Bible says Judas went out and, and hung himself. Um, go thou and do likewise, it says in another place. Put them together and you have, you know, Judas hanged himself. Go thou and do likewise. So then now there's a justification for <clears throat> someone committing suicide. Amen. Someone killing themselves. And many people have committed um, um, suicide spiritually by putting things together that ought not go together, or allowing the enemy to be deceptive um, to them and giving them scriptures out of context and then them saying, oh, God gave it to me that way and so I'm going to hold on to it. And he comes and he kills you. He puts sickness and disease on you <clears throat> and you hold on to it and he gives you messages. He has you write, you know, material. He has you do many things. And so now here, and so the root of that deception um, affects so many around you because then you begin to perpetrate or you begin to share, you begin to <coughs> minister that deception to the people around you. You wonder about, you know, the, the things that, you know, that um, cults use today. Usually it was someone in the early days of the cult experience that received a, a deceptive teaching or a deceptive appearance of an angel or somebody like that. And when they received it, I mean, something mushroomed in them. <coughs> and that deception became a worldwide organization, and we call them cults today. Certain scriptures then do hold people in bondage because they seem to say things which they do not say at all. And if you learn to rightly divide the word of God, it will produce liberty. But if you don't rightly divide it, it will produce bondage. You think about the bondage, you know, that so many people are in, in religion. You know, the, the dressing, the, the speaking, the various things that we do. Just as food, my friends, will produce physical strength for the body, so will the word of God produce spiritual strength for the spiritual man. We need to feast on God's word and be doers of it. Because that force on the inside requires, just like we stoke the fire, I don't know if any of you have been around a fireplace, but when you want, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not talking about the false fireplace where you have the, um, the gas fire or, or you have the, uh, you know, the electric fire. I'm talking about the fireplace where you have the true wood fire. You know, we used to have to cut wood in, um, when I lived in Oklahoma. <clears throat> and we would bring in the wood and we would put the wood on, you know, you know, in the fireplace and we would get the kindling and we'd put in there and then we would light the fire. And eventually you'd see the little sparks come up and you would see eventually how the wood began to burn and those embers. And if you needed the fire to continue, you just put another log on it. And that the first set of fire would ignite the new one. And so that's the kind of thing. The word of God ignites things in us. <clears throat> the word of God really uh, moves in us. You know, on the Mount of Temptation, and I posted this last night, you got to see this. On the Mount of Temptation, Jesus spoke three words that shook the very foundation of Satan's kingdom, and it shook it beyond repair. <clears throat> it shook it for eternity. When Satan came to Jesus, and Satan said, well, why don't you do this? Well, why don't you do that? Um, and, and these scriptures that Satan was quoting, these things that Satan was doing, the temptations of Jesus at the time, when he brought them to him, they were to derail Jesus and, and, and to hold Jesus in bondage to deception. And so Jesus responded with three words that absolutely shook the foundation of hell. <laughs> and it will shake the foundation of any deception in your life. Amen. That's why the power of God says, or the Spirit of God says, that we ought to understand the Word of God. Because we cannot shake the kingdom of, um, the kingdom of darkness with 
a deceptive word, but we will shake the kingdom of darkness with the right word, with the rhema word of God, with the living word of God. When we open our mouth and we begin to share <coughs> God's word in power, it shakes the kingdom. What did Jesus say? Three words that shook hell. Three words that shook uh, the foundation of circumstances. Three words that shook sickness and disease. It is written, my God, this morning. You know, how many times have you said that uh, today? It is written. Uh, my, my, my. It is written because, uh, you know, not just written um, for someone else, but it is written for you and I. It is written for us to exercise our authority. It, Jesus stood on a sure foundation and refused to speak anything except what his father said. Oh, woo. <laughs> Jesus refused to speak. So when we say the word of God, in effect, if we don't even use those three words in, in particular, we are still saying it. Because we say Isaiah 53 verse 5 says, we say 1 Peter 2.24 says, we say Psalm 91 says, the Davidic Psalms say, the book of Proverbs says, we say, you know, the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 8 says, if we worship, we will and shall be healed. <clears throat> you know, that God provides for our need. The book, the word of God says, hey, it is written. And when you open your mouth in the midst of a trial, when you open your mouth in the midst of a situation, you bring a tremendous, volcanic, tremendous, explosive force. We call it the dunamis power of God. Ha <laughs> ha, woo! We call it the dynamite, dunamis, earth-shaking, uh, land-reforming, my God, circumstance-adjusting, atmosphere-shifting power of God. Hallelujah. And we bring that to bear <clears throat> to the situation that confronts us. My God. So no weapon formed against us prospers. It is written... No weapon formed against us prospers. You know, um, in 2012, a friend of mine, she's on this morning, as a matter of fact, um, a friend of mine sent me a note a few days ago and said, in 2012, I, I've known her for quite a while, <laughs> amen, thank God. Um, she has been a, a partner with her ministry, and, you know, we have prayed together over her family and over her circumstances, and we have just had a really close spiritual relationship. Amen. We don't live in the same town or in the same part of Jamaica, <clears throat> but there's just been a, a kindred spiritual connection. So she sent me a note and said, in 2012, she was in a meeting where I was, I was ministering, and I gave her a word in 2012, and she opened up something, and she found this word, and the Lord said, do it now, amen, and when she did what the word said from 2012, my God, God prepared her from 2012, she saw a significant result, and I mean a life-changing, life-protecting uh, uh, result that came from it, my God. <clears throat> That's the power of the tremendous force of God in the earth. And we need to emerge into that. We need to flow into that. <clears throat> Amen? Because if God could speak with us from 2012, what is he saying right now? Woo! About our tomorrow. Woo! What was 2012, or is, because we're still in it, but what is 2012 telling us about 2021? My God. You see, my friends, it is so important for us to notice that when all else failed to move Jesus off the words, Satan himself began to quote scripture. What? When all the things that Satan came at that place of temptation and said to Jesus, you know, turn this into bread, turn that, do this. When everything else failed, he began to quote scripture. I wonder how many times Satan has quoted scripture to you and I. 
and we have taken that scripture. Well, I don't just jump on any scripture just like that. The Holy Spirit has to give me a good and clear understanding and comprehension of that scripture because I will not, you know, oh, um, in the book of Job, for example, how men fade and they're forgotten and da-da-da-da and all of this stuff and uh, how men are destroyed and God doesn't even take, you know, does not recognize them and so on. It is what a man said. It was those crazy friends of Job that said stuff like that. <clears throat> it wasn't the Lord. Um, it wasn't the inspiration of the Lord, but it was the inspiration of the kingdom of darkness that caused those men. And those are examples of things we ought not say and things we ought not do. Oh, when all else failed, as I said, to turn Jesus away from his father, Satan himself began to quote the scripture. The last and greatest of all the deceptions was to take the word out of context and to distort it, to make it say something different from the true meaning. I want you to listen to this. <clears throat> this was, you know, we call it a double barrel shotgun. Amen? <laughs> uh, this was his last ditch effort to throw Jesus off course. Listen to what he said. He says, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. <clears throat> and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Now, is that scripture? Yes, that's in the 91st Psalm. Woo, Lord have mercy. Satan is quoting the 91st Psalm. My God, ah, but hang on a second now. You'll notice the enemy quoted it almost word for word from Psalm 91. Verse 11 and 12, <clears throat> he drew it out of context to infer that Jesus could not commit suicide even by jumping off the pinnacle of the temple. My God. Psalm 91, verse 9 through 13 is another part of the passage. Our scripture is promising protection from evil, from plagues, from accidental destruction. But in no way does it apply to the willful act of destruction. Whoa! <clears throat> so Satan says, you willfully do it, and God will still protect you. No, 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 no. That's a totally different story. So he's telling Jesus, just do it. Come on now. Um, just, just go ahead. Uh, I mean, the Lord will protect you. But that's not the context of Scripture. The context of Scripture says that God protects you when you're walking through the valley. <laughs> when you don't realize what's going on. And even when you realize what's going on, you take your faith and you put your trust in God to keep you. It is not that you put yourself in the situation and uh, you willfully cause your own demise. No, no, no. But Satan was ready to use the word to do anything. In this, we see that we, you know, what we believe here is Satan's ultimate, ultimate deception to Christians today. That's what we see. Uh, he distorts men's minds with religious thinking that causes the very opposite meaning to be magnified and covers the true meaning with the garbage of intellectual reasoning. My God, this is a message that ought to be out there for everybody this morning. I mean, thousands of people ought to hear this, not just hundreds of people. That intellectual reasoning. There is probably, as, as I was going through this <clears throat> over the last few days, one of the things that came to me was that I think we have one of the most educated set of believers in the history of the church today. In 2020, we have some of the most educated and informed believers that and we have ever had in the history of the church, but yet we are intellectually fat. But we are spiritually, spiritually, um, uh, there's a term that I want, that's, that, that, that's, that's, that's not coming into me, anemic. We are intellectually fat, but we are spiritually anemic, my God. Why? Because the word of God has not prevailed as it ought to in our lives. And we have not had that flood of God's power, my Lord. The explosive force, uh, the engaging of uh, the supernatural side of our, of, of, of our existence, my God. He has done this with the, this has, Satan has done this with the great truths that Jesus taught concerning prayer. He has reasoned, he has reasoned that, hey, we don't have to 
we don't have to be consistent. We don't have, you know, God will give us a lie. God, we, we, can, we can make excuses. Uh, we can be slow and lethargic and slothful. My God. Effective prayer and effective release of power an effective focus on the word of God will destroy the kingdom of darkness and release the ability of God in the earth where you are. My God. God wants you. The Lord wants you. We say God sometimes it seems like he's way out there somewhere. No, no, no. <clears throat> but your heavenly father, the one that has relationship with you. He wants the glorious church. And the glorious church is not the building. My God, it's not those beautiful stained glasses and <clears throat> stained glass windows. It's not the nice things in there on the altar. It's not the wonderful robes. My God. It's not the prayer shawl. I see so many people using prayer shawls today. <clears throat> you know, prophetic shawl or whatever they may want to call them. I mean, I have one. You know, I bought one many years ago and the Lord asked me one day, why are you using that thing? <laughs> I have a prayer shawl. <clears throat> and I remember, you know, I went out and I saw other people using it. I said, well, I'm going to use it too. Amen. And the Lord said to me, why are you using that? <laughs> he says, my anointing is within you, not in the shawl. And that is, own well, let me not get too much into that. He was just talking to me. And he corrected me. And he says, we are going back to things that we have been delivered from. Amen. And he said the power is in the word that comes out of your mouth. As the church of Jesus Christ comes to the knowledge of its authority. Uh, as you and I come to the knowledge of, of the power of God. That, uh, you know, that power that's down deep in our belly. Um, that power that's turning and wants to erupt into a tremendous force in the earth. As we come into that power and we come and really understand how we are joined heirs with Christ, we will truly begin to make an impact and a significant impact in the earth. Other than that, we will make a surface impact. Other than that, the world will remain where the world is. <clears throat> Other than that, 2020 will be viewed as an awful year. Churches are wondering right now, um, will people come back to church? <laughs> will the members uh, come back and will they give the same as they used to give? I'm sure there are church members and ministry partners like you that give to us regardless. However, there are people that during from February, March, April, May, June, they just stopped giving. They stopped going into church and they stopped you know, participating. But they wondered, well, does I wonder if they think, <clears throat> so what, what about the laws of God? So you stopped giving and you began to do other things. Well, what about the laws of God? When you were in church, did you believe in those laws of giving and receiving? So now what's going on? You have given the enemy an opportunity to be destructive in your life. And the destruction doesn't happen immediately. The consequences don't happen immediately. But the consequences will come. So they're believing now. The church now is wondering. And we just had something in Jamaica about that. What's going on? Will people come back to church? If the church doors are swung wide open and now we say church is open and everybody can come back, will people really come back? And people are, are worried. <clears throat> Leaders are worried. Would they come back? But here is something that you have to understand. The ones that had the true relationship will always be with Christ. Amen. They will always come back home. Amen. Because they never really left. They may have left the building, but they have never left the body of Christ. Woo! <laughs> <coughs> they may have left the particular address, amen, but they have never left the body of Christ. And so I thank God for those that have kept their faithful commitment to be a part of the body, that have kept their faithful commitment, you know, to have the power of God move in and through them. My God. My God, my God, how awesome is that? So this morning, my friends, let me go back to that word that I shared with you before, that one that I put online. When Jesus, by the way, that is in the fourth chapter of the book of Luke, Jesus spoke the three words that totally uprooted 
the foundation of the kingdom of darkness. <clears throat> that through, uh, to me, to me, those three words were like dropping the bomb, like was dropped, the U.S. dropped the bomb on Nagasaki and Hiroshima in, in, the, in that last world war. Well, guess what? Um, Jesus dropped a nuclear bomb <laughs> in, uh, in Satan's kingdom by saying, it is written. Let us begin to drop some nuclear bombs. Let us begin to bombard the gates of hell with, it is written. Because that will make a tremendous impact and will create a tremendous difference in what God does in the earth and in the circumstances of your life and those for whom you pray, your family members, my God, woo, hallelujah, your finances, you know, your personal health. What a tremendous opportunity it is for you to drop some bombs, amen, and to begin to destroy the very foundation, the strongholds that the enemy has attempted to establish in your life and in the lives of those around you. My gracious Father. My friends, this morning I want to thank you for joining me. Again, I'm Bishop Winston Watson, Pastor Winston Watson. This is Morning Prayer Live. And uh, here is the scripture, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Do you remember that? For we walk by faith and not by sight. you got to remember that this, the, the, the word of God prevails. The word of God is powerful. We walk by faith and not by sight. It is so important for us to recognize that. It's not the things we see. Um, Second Corinthians, again, um, it tells us that the Apostle Paul, in writing to the Corinthian church, he tells us that the things we see, the physical, touchable, feelable things we see, they are temporary, but the things we don't see, they are eternal. My God, my spirit man is eternal on the inside. Amen. Uh, the things that I see have come from the eternal spirit. My God. And so this morning, I want that effervescing, <clears throat> that volcanic light power to begin to flow out of me. I want the deep wells of the spirit within me to begin to push a force of God's power out that will make a tremendous difference. My God. I want you to watch this again. I want you to, 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 to listen to what I've said again. Because 2021, we are, we are coming down. This is, I think, the 27th day. Thanksgiving. The th we are still on the Thanksgiving holiday in the United States, I'm sure. Um, but yesterday was Thanksgiving Day. You know, everybody ate and enjoyed. And remember, when I was, when I was in, in, in Tulsa and I would drive up to my brother in Kansas um, City, uh, up there in Missouri, <clears throat> when I would drive up, and I remember at one point, <laughs> one particular Thanksgiving day, you know, we stood there, we held hands around the table. And uh, my brother asked me to pray. And all of a sudden, it felt like electricity left my hands. And everybody kind of moved. And, and he told me afterwards, I didn't say anything. He told me, he said he felt something move. Why? Because this, in the season of Thanksgiving, we are preparing ourselves to enter that new. In, in America and in any part of our life, when we enter into an atmosphere of Thanksgiving, it is actually preparing us for a new season. Woo! Hallelujah. When in Matthew chapter 8, the young man came for a thanksgiving celebration to Jesus when he was freed from leprosy, Jesus said, go, you are made not just healed, but you are made completely whole. A new season, you know, was before him. He entered into something that everybody thought was impossible. That everybody had said, come on now, you got to go to the leper colony. That's the end of your life. But no, 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 no. There is a restoration that has come. Why? Because the power of God has come into your life. This morning, my friends, let the power of God manifest and change in situations 
and to the circumstances of your life. May God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Have a miraculous weekend. <clears throat> I pray that God manifests in you and through you in the mighty name of Jesus. And no matter what has happened around you, remember that the last word is not the circumstance that occurred with your neighbor. The last word of God is not the circumstance that occurred in another country, but it is what the word of God says. Because as Jesus said, you have your own right and privilege to say, it is written, and drop that blast of a bomb, amen, in the middle of the kingdom of darkness. God bless you, and we'll see you next time. In Jesus' name, amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God.